Okay, let's get started today. Have, I guess, three things on the agenda. I want to show you something with uh, joins that may help clear up some of the terminology issues. Yesterday I was meeting with my TAs and I drew a diagram and they said share it with you all because they thought it made um, the terminology behind joins a lot easier to understand. Not how to do them, just the terminology. Then I want to kind of quickly review the concepts behind entity relationship modeling and cover the connection traps because we did not get to those on Tuesday and then go into the main course for today which is the design case study. It's an investment case study that shows you the process of creating an ER diagram from a requirements document which is what you'll have to do both for the next homework assignment plus you'll have to do it on the exam. That will be one of the questions on the exam. So, starting out first with joins, there's kind of a whole bunch of terminology that was thrown at you when we went through joins. We talked about, uh-oh, whoops. There's one missing cable on my smart tablet. Hopefully that will, there we go. So you heard about theta joins. You may not remember them, but those were the most general type of joins where you'd have A, some kind of predicate here, B, whoops, A join, and it could be any type of predicate, less than, greater than, greater than, equal. You never use these types of joins in practice, but they're the most general. And you heard about equijoins and natural joins. And there were inner joins. And there were outer joins. And there was a left join, and there was a right join, and there was a fold join. And of course, it's very easy. Ooh, and there's one more join. There's the semi-join. So with all those joins, it's very easy to get confused about what's going on. Okay? So the first thing to realize is actually there's kind of two orthogonal axes for considering joins. So along one axis is the type, well, um, is the operation, the predicate that's being used. So that encompasses the first three, the theta join, the equi join, and the natural join. So the theta join could use any of the relational operators in its predicate. The equi join used an equal sign. And the natural join is one with the equal sign and matching on any of the common columns. And it's the one where you're allowed to drop the predicate from the join symbol because it, if you drop it, by definition, it's a natural join. So the natural join is a subset of equijoins, and equijoins are a subset of theta joins. Okay, because equal, it should be clear with equijoin and theta join that equality is a subset of all of the relational operators, and then with natural join. Natural join is just an equijoin where you're doing it on all of the common columns in the two relations. Now, along the next axis, you have inner join and outer join. Okay, 
so an inner join only returns tuples that have matching keys in both relations. Whereas an outer join says that we want some of the non-matching tuples too. For example, if we have A and here is B's relation and we have ID, ID and we'll say GPA and here we'll say course. If this is ID 1, 2, 3, this is 1, 3, 4, then the inner join would only return the tuple with 1 because that's the only uh, tuple, I'm sorry, 1 and 3, because 1 and 3, it would return two tuples, the inner join, the 1 and the 3, because they're the two that match. Whereas an outer join returns additional tuples. Now, the question is, what additional tuples are returned by an outer join? And that depends on whether it is a left, a right, or a full join. So if it's a left join, what does it also return from this A and B? Everything in A. So it returns 2 as well as 1 and 3 because 2 doesn't match. If it's a right join, it returns what? B. Everything in B. 1, 3, and 4. And if it's a full join, it returns everything, but there will be nulls in the tuples for 2 and 4. Okay, similarly when it returns, the left join returns everything for A, there will be nulls in the B columns for tuple 2, tuple with ID number 2. Okay? And then a semi-join is a type of inner join where it returns all matching tuples in. If I do A semi-join B, it returns all matching tuples in A. So it returns, basically a semi-join says we want all tuples in A that have some match in B and we want all of the attributes from A, generally. Okay, so that's kind of a, hopefully that shows you a better how to classify things. So you can have an inner join that is a natural join or an equi join or a theta join. You can have an outer join that is a natural join, an equi join, or a theta join. So the inner outer is one axis and the natural equi theta is the other axis. Okay, they're orthogonal. And then when we refer to a left, right, or full join, we're always referring to an outer join. We simply don't include outer because it's kind of redundant. But when we say left join, what we really are saying is left outer join. If we just say join and we don't qualify it, we're talking about typically an inner natural join. So if I just say A join B without any other kind of adjectives, what I'm typically talking about is an inner join that is a natural join. Okay, because that's the most common type of join we perform. If you want some other type of join, you would generally say A semi join B or A left join B using an equi join. If I just say join without specifying the type of join, it's typically a natural join. Otherwise, I will say, oh, it's A join B with A dot X equal B dot Y. And now you know it's an equi join because I've specified the predicate. Okay. With a natural join, many of you on the homework have expressed the predicate, I have no problem with that, but you don't have to express a predicate with a natural join because it's implied. So questions about that? We good? Okay. This, of course, is good fodder for multiple choice answers or questions on the exam. So good to know that. Okay.
So, before we get into our problems with ER diagrams, let's just very quickly do the five-minute review so that you kind of remember everything that's going on. So, there are two types of design techniques for creating relations from a requirements document. One is a top-down technique called Entity Relationship Modeling, which we typically just abbreviate as ER modeling or ER design. And the other is a bottom-up approach called normalization, which we will talk about next week. And ER design, basically design, whether it's ER design or normalization, both focus on the same three ideas, which is we need to identify the entities in our database, we need to identify the relationships between those entities, and we need to identify the attributes for those entities. And from these three things, we need to extract a set of relations, a set of attributes, and a set of primary and foreign keys, with the foreign keys reflecting the relationships among our entities. Okay, so then we talked about UML, the Unified Modeling Language. And it typically ER designs are expressed pictorially using this UML language. It's a pictorial language. So you'll often hear the words ER diagram or UML diagram. They're interchangeable. They're synonymous. Okay. I know that if you look online, you will find some other bells and whistles that go with UML. Please stick to what we present in the course because otherwise the TAs may get it in your head that you copied it from somewhere. So I know that there's other facets to UML that we're not talking about in this course. And, um, I think we cover chapter 12 and we don't cover chapter 13. Chapter 13 is more advanced ER design and we just don't have time to do it. At any rate, entities are represented as labeled boxes. Then relationships are just relationships between entities like a um, realtor manages a property or a realtor leases a property to a client. Those are relationships. And we denote relationships between binary or binary relationships, which are relationships between two entities as a directed edge, a labeled directed edge. And we try to use action verbs for the label. And typically, the direction of the arrow is toward the relation that has the foreign key. The foreign key is what ties the two entities together. And the entity that's going to hold the foreign key is typically the entity to which the edge is directed. So for example, every staff has a branch number in their relation indicating which branch they belong to. So we direct the edge from branch to staff. And I said you don't have to put the edge, um, directed edge here. It's often easier just to put it right on the line itself. Okay, now if you have more than two entities participating in a relation, you use a diamond instead. And the name of the relation then goes inside the diamond. And what was the other thing we said about these multi-entity relations? What other thing is different from a binary relationship? No directed edge. The edges are all undirected. Okay, then making sure that you don't represent ternary relationships as an entity because generally relationships end up as relations in your database but that doesn't make them an entity so you shouldn't show them as an entity in your ER diagram you need to show them as a relationship okay then 
we talked about other types of relationships, recursive relationships, the fact that you can have relationships in both directions between two branches. You'll see that today in the case study. I won't belabor it. With attributes, you were introduced to a number of new distinctions for attributes. So there's three axes, kind of an X, Y, and Z. So you can have a simple or composite attribute. A composite attribute is composed of either simple or composite attributes itself. The common example used for a composite attribute is an address. Very good. You can also have single-valued or multi-valued attributes. Single-valued attribute has only one value for a cell. A multi-valued attribute wants to have multiple values for a cell. That is a problem because the relational model doesn't allow multiple values in a cell. It allows only one. So we deal with that problem typically by moving multi-valued attributes into a separate relation. Okay, and in my opinion, the book treats multi-valued attributes as weak entities, which we will get to in a moment. But first, the third type of attribute is a derived attribute. It's an attribute not explicitly stored in the database. It might be stored in a view, but it can be derived from some combination of other attributes. Hey, and we went through three types. There was attributes you compute from aggregate functions, like total, well, really it's sum, or average, or count. There's attributes that you can derive from two or more columns in the same relation, and the example I gave was the length of stay at a hotel, which you can get by subtracting date from from date to. And the third type of at derived attribute is an attribute that you can get from attributes in different relations. And the example I gave was the total revenue derived from a customer stay, where we had to get the length of stay from the booking relation, the price of the room from the room relation, and multiply those two quantities together. That's a derived attribute from those two relations, the room relation and the booking relation. Okay, we've really covered keys before. The only new term you saw was the term composite key. That's simply a candidate key that consists of two or more attributes. Okay, and we showed you how to represent attributes in ER diagrams with the proviso that on the homework assignment and in the exam, I actually don't want to see attributes listed in the ER diagram. I just want to see the relation name. But in the real world, your boss may want to see attributes and this diagram shows how that's how they're laid out. We talked about strong and weak entity types. I said I really d won't even test you on this, but I expect you to know it because it does come up in the real world sometimes. The weak entity type is its existence depends on the strong entity type. It would disappear if that strong entity disappeared. So for example, rooms in a hotel are in some sense a weak entity type because if their hotel disappears, they disappear. Okay, the book seems to treat attributes as weak entity types because here they have a client who's expressed a preference, but really that preference is a set of um, attributes that could be multi-valued. Okay, then we talked about the fact that relationships can have attributes, and if they do, you represent the attributes in the labeled box because it's a relationship and not an entity where the entity name would normally go is blank. And there's a dotted line to that relationship. And finally, we talked about the structural constraints we put on relationships. These are so-called business policies. When we talk about the different types of constraints in the relational model, you may remember we talked about entity integrity, which meant that the primary key couldn't be null. 
We talked about referential integrity, which meant that the foreign key either referenced a legitimate tuple in the parent relation or had all nulls. We talked about business policies or general constraints, and this is what structural constraints are about, is those business policies, such as no realtor can manage more than 100 properties. So this type of constraint is called a multiplicity constraint. And we break multiplicity into a range, a minimum and a maximum number. The minimum number is called the participation rate, and the maximum is called the cardinality. cardinality. Very good. So on our diagrams, we show the minimum and maximum separated by two dots. So one dot dot one in this case means that there is a minimum of one staff member that um, a, that is in, let's see, there's in a relationship with a branch, a staff member belongs to a minimum of one branch and a maximum of one branch. I'm sorry, that's, I've messed this up. This is the manager's relationship. So what it's saying is that there is a branch is managed by exactly one staff member. And a staff member manages either zero branches or a maximum of one branch. So the multiplicity gives the number of occurrences of an entity in a single relationship occurrence. So in a single manages occurrence, there can be a minimum of one staff member and a maximum of one. So we must have a staff member managing a branch. Okay, the book also talks about the degree of a relationship. So again, it is orthogonal. We talk about multiplicity is one thing, degree is another. And the book is in, it, it confuses the two. It's not clear that these are two different concepts that are orthogonal. The degree of a relationship is where you take the maximum cardinalities of each entity and put them together. And there's three types of degrees, one-to-one, one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. Many. Okay, so... Here, this is a one-to-one -one relationship because the maximum cardinality in the manages is one and one. For managing properties, it's a one-to-many because one staff can manage or oversee many properties. And you use the asterisk to indicate an unbounded number. And here is a many-to-many -many relationship denoted as star, colon, star. A newspaper can advertise one or more properties for rent. A property for rent can be advertised in zero or more newspapers. Therefore, it's a many-many relationship. Okay, and we want to make it clear that this is the wrong way to represent a many-many relationship. I see this often in homework assignments and exams. So advertisement is a relationship, but it's being shown here as an entity, and that's wrong. Because it obscures the fact that there's a direct relationship between newspaper and property for rent. It's really newspaper advertises property for rent. It's not that a newspaper lists it advertisements and a property for rent appears in advertisements. That's not right. If you see something where you have two edges coming into an entity, and both of these edges seem to have uh, unbounded cardinalities, you may be suspicious and think I've inadvertently represented a relationship 
as an entity. That's one way to debug your ER diagrams. If after you've created your ER diagrams, you seem to have an entity that has two arrows coming into it, and both the arrows have a unbounded cardinality, you may wish to consider whether that should have been a relationship, a many, many relationship rather than an entity. It still may be an entity, but it's something you need to check. Okay? And then the final thing we talked about is what do you do when you have a relationship involving multiple entities? How do you calculate the multiplicity in that case? And the way you do it is you, hold, you create, quote, a actual occurrence of that relationship, or the way I do it is I create an actual occurrence of that relationship by filling in values for all but one of the entities. And once I've done that, I figure out how many occurrences of the remaining entity there can be. So for example, if I'm trying to figure out what the, this should be, I would come up with an example occurrence for staff, say Brad, and an example client. And then I'd say, for Brad and the client Smiley, how many branches can Smiley be registered at? Well, the answer is a minimum of one and a maximum of one, so that would be the multiplicity of a branch. Now, I want to figure out what should be the multiplicity for client. So, now I'm going to put in specific things for staff, I'll say Brad, in a branch, say UTK. So now I want to know how many clients can Brad register at the UTK branch? Well, if I'm a horrible salesperson, the answer is zero. Or maybe I'm a trainee, so it's zero. But if I'm really good, it can be an unbounded number. So it's the number I put for, or the multiplicity I put for client is zero to many. Okay, for those of you who are mathematically inclined, you can think of it as there is a relationship among three entities, and when you're trying to get the multiplicity for each entity, you think of the remaining entities as parameters to your function, and the question is, what is the cardinality of that function? How many values can it have? So if the value can be, there can be zero occurrences, it would be zero. If there could be a maximum of one, it would be one. But that's only if you're mathematically inclined should you think of it that way. I prefer to just substitute concrete values for each of the entities and then figure out how many occurrences there can be for the remaining entity. Okay, what we did not get to, and which we will do now, is problems with ER models. Actually, I've already talked to you about a couple of the problems, which is the tendency, when you're new to this, to want to make a relationship an entity, rather than showing it as a relationship. So. That's one issue. But there's also things called connection traps that can result in our diagrams. So these diagrams are essentially graphs. They're directed graphs to some extent. Um, although the multi-relation uh, or multi-entity relationships are undirected. But nonetheless, they're essentially graphs with some degree of directedness. So some connections come up that create problems, and they fall into two types of traps. One are called fan traps, and one are called chasm traps. So fan traps arise when you have two arrows that you would think should go sequentially, but instead they go in opposite directions. So here's an example. Let's say we have a division, and in our 
ER diagram, we said that the division operates one or more branches. And also the division has one or more staff. Okay? And we want to ask the question, which branch does Brad belong to? So Brad is a staff member, and we want to know which branch does Brad belong to. And it turns out we can't answer the question because there is not a directed path from branch to staff. Okay, we can find out which division the staff is in, but then we can't find out which branch the that staff member is in. Okay, so if we look at the fan trap, it looks like this. So this is called some a semantic net. So you have your staff members here. And you can see these two staff members belong to this division. And you can see that this staff member belongs to this division. You can see division one operates two branches. Well, the problem is you come into division and you don't know if I'm asking which branch SG37 belongs to. Well, it could be either B3 or B7. So it's kind of fanning out here, right here. It's getting squished into a single point, and then at the division point, it fans out again. Hence, fan trap. Okay? So it fans in to a choke point, and then it fans back out, but at that choke point, you lose information. And the problem is caused by the fact that the, there's not a path between a directed path between the entities. Okay, so the way to correct that is to redraw the entity relationship diagram. So the problem is really that branch is in some sense smaller than division and staff is smaller than branch. Okay, the division is the big thing on the organization chart, then a branch is lower on the organization chart and staff is at the bottom. So you just reorganize the ER diagram and now you have a nice directed path from division to staff. And now you can answer the question because Brad belongs to maybe branch B003 and branch B003 belongs to division such and such. So if we're looking at it now, it's no more fan traps, we see that Brad, maybe SG37, belongs to branch B003, which then belongs to D1. So eventually, it fans into D1 right here, but it doesn't fan in prematurely. The D1 is no longer the choke point that it was in the previous diagram. Okay, so fan traps occur when things fan into a choke point and then they fan back out from that choke point. And that involves a loss of information. Okay, and typically, because you may not actually end up drawing these, this is one way to see it, is by drawing this so-called semantic net. But another way generally to see it is that you think there should be a directed path from one entity like, say, staff to divi um, division through branch, but there's not. You want to be able to get from staff to branch, but you can't because the edges aren't right. So that's a fan trap. The chasm trap, OK, so here the pathway is ambiguous in a fan trap. In a chasm trap, what happens is it looks like there's a pathway between entities, but when you actually get to an occurrence, a concrete occurrence, that pathway is missing. So here is an example of a chasm trap. So in the general diagram, we have branch has staff which oversee property for rent. So it looks like 
we should be able to determine for any given property which branch it belongs to because there is a directed path from branch to property for rent. So it sure looks like that for any property we simply determine which staff member manages it and then we determine which branch that staff member belongs to. But when we get to specific occurrences of the relationship, look at what can happen. So we have this property for rent, PA 14, that's not managed by any staff member. Oops, now we have no idea which branch PA 14 belongs to. It may well be that PA 14 belongs to branch 3 and simply has not yet been assigned to a realtor. It's being um, renovated. So it's not actually assigned to a realtor, but there's still a branch to which it belongs. So this is a chasm trap because it looked like there was a path from a branch to this property, but when we looked at the actual semantic net, that path was missing. And the problem occurs when you get zeros showing up in the participation rates on your path. If an intermediate node in your diagram has a zero in the participation rate, then you can get a chasm trap. So the issue if you're trying to identify it, is right here. This is the cause of the chasm trap. That participation rate is zero, and because it's zero, it may mean that in the actual, in when you actually look at relationships, you may have a property for rent that is not managed by a staff member, and therefore you cannot determine which branch the property for rent belongs to. So a chasm trap is caused by a is caused by an intermediate, I'll say entity, that has a zero in its participation rate. Okay, so that's what causes a chasm trap. It looks like there's a path, but if you look closely, you see there's a zero in the participation rate somewhere in the middle of that path, and that causes a chasm trap. So the solution is to add an additional edge to your ER diagram. So in this case, we put a direct edge from branch to property for rent. And now we say that the branch offers one or more properties for rent. And every property for rent would have both a staff number and a branch number in it. Okay, now, this solution um, the fan trap introduces no problems with its solution. This chasm trap, though, by solving one problem, creates another problem. Okay? What happens if a property for rent is moved to a staff, another staff member? What could be the issue? <clears throat> could be in a different branch. Very good. So the problem that it introduces is redundancy. Normally, we could figure out which branch the property belongs to by simply looking at its staff number. By adding a branch number to each property for rent, we're introducing what is often redundant data. 
And if we change the staff number, we also have to remember to change the branch number, or else there'll be an inconsistency in our database. So this actually shows an example where you can't have your cake and eat it too in relational databases. You're going to either have to be satisfied with having a chasm trap or you're going to have redundant data. It's going to be one or the other. Either you're going to have to be satisfied with not always being able to answer the query, which branch does this property belong to, or you're going to have to worry about the fact you're going to have to add redundant data, in which case you're going to have to make sure that when you update the staff number, you update the branch number as well. Okay, so this is definitely a case of you can't have your cake and eat it too. With the fan trap, you can have your cake and eat it too. When you solve a fan trap, you solve the problem. <clears throat> When you solve a chasm trap, you introduce a new problem. It's like whack-a-mole. Hit it here, mold disappears, reappears over there. Questions about these two types of traps? I don't expect you to worry about these traps when you create your ER diagrams for your homework assignments or exams. It's kind of more of an advanced concept. However, if I gave you a diagram like this one, and I said identify where the chasm trap occurs, you should circle the zero here. Or if I give you a diagram like this one, and I say what kind of trap is illustrated by this diagram, you should tell me it is a fan trap. And if I ask you how you would, so, or I might say, this is an example of a fan trap. How should I redraw the ER diagram to fix it? I expect you to know how to do that. Okay, so there's a difference between this type of problem where I'm, for example, saying, hey, it's a fan trap. How do you reorder it versus you're inadvertently creating one in a requirements document? There that's subtle and you may not be able to easily find it. Okay, here I'm cueing you chasm trap or fan trap. So I think then you should be able from that cue to be able to figure out the rest. Okay, we good? Questions? Okay, I know I took a bunch of time with that, but our case study actually doesn't require huge amounts of time, and so I think getting through all of that was important. Okay, I should have emphasized to you that you should have read this before coming today to class, but since I didn't, why don't you take about, if you go to the lecture notes and you go to 919 921, you will see a link called Investment Firm Design Case. Why don't you all take about three minutes and scan through the problem? Okay, I will, if you don't have your computer with you, put it up here so you can scan through it. So this is what's called a requirement stock.
Okay, don't worry if you haven't finished reading it because you'll have plenty of time as I'm going through it. So you've been given some requirements in the first part of the requirements document, and then you want to answer, you want basically the idea is I want to draw an ER diagram. So in order to draw the ER diagram, I have to begin by identifying the entities and the attributes, and they, if possible, the relationships. And so what I want to do is kind of go through and show you what you should be thinking about when you read these requirements documents because they are very, they basically, when they're worded right, will pretty much have the relationships, the entities, and the attributes pretty much stand out. And it just becomes a matter of identifying what is what. So the first thing you want to do is you want to identify your entities. Now one big thing that comes up is many students want to say that the firm is an entity. It's not. It is the database that we're keeping. So a lot of times on both exams and homework problems, I see something like firm or company as an entity. It's not. Okay, think about it. How many occurrences of the tuple would there be in the relation? One. It's not very interesting. So it's not an entity. Okay, it is simply the what the database is about. Now, offices, that's something physical. Remember, entities tend to have a physical existence. So that seems to be an entity. Each office has a number of investment advisors. Those seem to be something that could be an entity. They're pretty physical. Who service investors. Investors seems like they might be an entity. Okay. Investors own stocks. Now I know stocks are kind of a financial instrument, but Companies aren't. It's kind of like you're owning a company. Stocks are a, a piece of paper, a financial instrument, but that sounds, stocks sounds like that could be an entity. Okay? So usually the first couple things introduce most of the entities. After that, you're probably getting more information about the entities. You may find entities later on, but the first two, in this case actually just A, we've identified four entities. I'm going to, instead of trying to identify all the entities, I'm going to go through these one at a time and deal with them. So right now we're dealing with A. Okay? So... A also is saying something about relationships. So it says that each office, I'm going to underline these now in green to indicate relationships, so each office has a number of investment advisors. So that seems to indicate a relationship between office and investment advisors. So that seems to be a relationship. Then we seem to have another one. I'm going to run out of ink. Advisors who service investors. Seems to be another one. Investors own stocks. Okay, that seems to be another relationship. Now that paid dividends, that's a little more um, ambiguous at this point. It's really an attribute. Dividend is really an attribute. So this is really, the dividend is really an attribute of a stock. Now, you don't yet know, really, is that a multi-valued attribute? Is it a single-valued attribute? 
Does it even have to exist? Some stocks don't pay dividends, but for the moment, it's just enough to know that a dividend is going to be an attribute. Okay, now A has more information for us. It has some information about the multiplicity of the relationship. So it says each office, so here each office has a number. So each tends to be one, right? Whereas number tends to be many. So this is also saying something about the multiplicity of the relationship. Okay, advisors who service investors. Well, this is a little ambiguous. It could be many to many the way that it's written. So this is ambiguous. I'm going to put a question mark here for multiplicity because we're not yet sure. Do multiple advisor, can it be the case that multiple advisor service one investor and that, um, let's see, how should I say this? Is it the case that one investor may have multiple advisors and one advisor may have multiple investors? We don't know that yet. This is kind of ambiguous. And investors own stocks is also kind of ambiguous. So we will put that off. Now we come to B. So notice I kind of marked this up because it contains a lot of useful information. So now we get to B. An office is managed by one of its advisors. Okay, this appears to be a relationship. This is my fourth relationship. An office is managed by one of its advisors. It also seems to be giving us information about the multiplicity of this relationship. So it seems that an office, one office, is managed by one of its advisors. It seems to be implying that the degree of this relationship, not multiplicity, but the degree, it's a one to one, and it seems to be saying, tentatively, that when we draw the relationship that it's one office, so if we have advisor and office, it appears that probably one advisor, exactly one advisor, manages zero or one offices. This seems to kind of be the assumption we're building from B. Now, if later on we get further information information that contradicts it, we will update it. But right now that seems to be the case. Okay, so at this point I could even be tentatively putting together my ER diagram. Perhaps I should do that. So I identified four entities. I identified office, I identified advisor, I identified investor, and I identified stock. So I can even be tentatively putting together my ER diagram. And if I go back here, I, had, I said that each office has a number of investment advisors, so Going over here, I might say office, I'll say employees, because I want it to be more of an action verb, and unfortunately, I, I, this is one case where it would be nice if I could have things side by side. It's not going to really work. So. Then advisors who service investors, so this seems to be a relationship. Now I'm going to say advise rather than services. And we have investors own stocks.
Okay. Now in B, we came up with an office is managed by one of its advisors. So it would appear that we also have this relationship. An advisor manages an office. Okay, and I'm actually going to redraw this. I'm going to, I need to use the whole screen, so I'm going to get a new one. Investor, I'm sorry, I want to start with offices. Oops. So I want to start office. I'm just, I'm redrawing it. I'm going to use the whole screen. Office, investor, advisor, stock. <laughs> So office, employees, advisor, manages, also an advisor advises, and an investor owns stock. Okay, and I kind of had come up with some tentative multiplicities. I thought that an office is managed by one of its advisors, so I tentatively came up with the fact that a office is managed by exactly one advisor, and an advisor may manage zero to one office. Also from the description, it seemed like a office could employ one to many advisors and probably, but we're not certain yet, but we'll make the assumption that an advisor has exactly one office to which the advisor is attached. We're not so sure about what happens with advisors and investors. And we're also not so sure about the multiplicity of the investor and the stock. We hope to get some clarification. If the requirements document didn't have that clarification, you could ask someone at the company or in a homework assignment, you could ask me. So if you're not certain. Okay, so an investor has a name a unique investor number, a single investment advisor, and zone zero or more stocks. Okay, well this is giving us both information about relationships and attributes. So it's telling us that an investor has as attributes a name, a unique investment number, what should that ring a bell in your head? Unique investment number. Primary key. Anytime you see the word unique, that strongly reeks of primary key. Okay, a single investment advisor. Hmm. Foreign key. So this is PK, foreign key. This is a foreign key. It's an entity, an a Investment advisor, we've already determined that an investment advisor is an entity. That sounds like a foreign key. Okay, it also tells us something about the multiplicity of that relationship. The fact that we say they have a single investment advisor means the cardinality is one. So... We know when we go over here that an investor, we can fill in this, presumably an investor has a maximum of one. It says has a single investment advisor. It sounds like it's a minimum of one and a maximum of one. So we can fill in that 
part of the multiplicity equation. And it says an investor can own zero or more stocks. So that fills in this, can own zero or more stocks, so zero to many. If there was an upper bound like 100, then we would say zero dot dot 100. But there is no upper bound here, so we say zero dot dot star. Now, you might say, what is, you might say, well, what is this? Is this a multi-valued attribute? No, it's not a multi-valued attribute. In fact, what's going to happen is the stock, presumably, there's going to, we're going to find out that this is more or less a relationship. So, well, you could tentatively, I'll put a question mark here. Exactly what is this beast? What is this? Attribute, relationship. Sometimes you have to defer it and hope to come back to it. We're going to come back to it in this case. Okay, so we'll leave a question mark there. We're coming back to it. We're not exactly sure what's coming off here. Okay, so let's move on now to D. Each investor's holding of a stock contains information about the stock's ticker symbol, the stock's name, the number of shares of stock owned by the investor, and the dividend per share paid by the stock. Okay, well, increasingly, what this is looking like is a relationship. So, a holding, we know that investors own a stock, and that was shown as a relationship here. So it's looking like, whoops, it's looking like D is giving us information about the attributes of a relationship. So this is really info about the owns relationship. So it's giving us information about the owns relationship. It looks like this relationship has attributes. It has the stock's ticker symbol, the stock's name, the number of shares, the dividend paid, and the cumulative holding. Well, actually, the cumulative holding is the number of shares. So it looks like this is something where it's dot, dot, dot. And we have things like ticker, shares, name, and dividend. That stock name. So those are four attributes of this owns relationship. The ticker symbol, the number of shares we own, so that's number of shares. I know that doesn't read very well. Sorry, it's number. I can't see if I can make. Uh, I think I can make this thinner. Maybe. Maybe not. Pen. Thickness, maybe here. Ah, thickness. Let's go for that. Okay, so number, whoops. Number, nope, it's not working. Number of shares, sorry. You just have to be able to understand what I'm saying. Okay, so that was D, info about the owns relationship.
Now we go to E. An investment advisor has a name, a unique advisor number, ding, 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 primary key, one or more investors at the advisor services and an office to which the advisor belongs. So this looks like an attribute, has a name. This is an attribute, which is should be the primary key. One or more investors that the advisor services. Okay, remember it was ambiguous, advisors who service investors. But now we have figured out that really a single investment, whoops, an investor has a single investment advisor. And now we find out that an investment advisor has one or more advisees. So we can label the other side of this as advises one to many investors. Okay, and it explicitly says one, so that's the participation rate, or more. That's the cardinality. Okay, that's not saying that there's a foreign key. When you have many, that's probably not going to be represented as an attribute. At the very least, when it says many, it's going to have to go in a different relation. And an office to which the advisor belongs. That sounds like what? Foreign key. It's a single value and a office to which the advisor belongs. So we can go back here and sure enough, let's see, a advisor has a single office, one one. So we were right. We already put in that multiplicity, but that just confirmed what we thought that an advisor belonged to a single office. Okay, so E is done. By the way, notice we're answering the questions down here of entity, what the attributes are, what the primary keys are, and what the foreign keys are as we go through this. Okay, F. An office has an office number and address. Well, hopefully that office number is a primary key. That's where you might ask for some clarification. Is it unique or not? That's where it wasn't clear. You might want to clarify that assumption. But I am going to clarify by saying why yes. That is the primary key and address is simply a attribute. Probably the address is what kind of key? Composite. composite, very good. And it's a composite key. Could it be a primary key? It's unique, but it's not. So what do we call keys that could be primary keys but not? Candidate, Candidate keys. And they have another term, alternate keys. So they're both candidate keys and they're alternate keys. Okay, an alternate key is a candidate key that did not become the primary key. Okay, so not a lot there with F, but it does give us the attributes for an office and the primary key. G, an advisor is associated with only one office. Okay, that's yet further confirmation that we were right in saying that the cardinality is one. And this says that an advisor is associated with only one office. So the cardinality of that relationship was one. An office may have multiple advisors. Okay, that's confirmation of the fact that the cardinality right here can be many.
An office can have many advisors. That's just confirmation of something we'd already assumed. I, the dividend per share is determined by the stock. Okay, what that pretty much means is that dividend is an attribute of a stock and it is a fixed quantity. So it's a single valued, before I had a question mark, what is this? It's a single valued attribute. Down here, we get the fact that it's a single valued attribute of a stock. What else do you think are attributes of a stock that doesn't really, wasn't really mentioned, but you could kind of infer? It's ticker, which is probably the unique symbol because that's what is Whenever you make, for those of you who are investors, when you buy a stock, you enter the ticker symbol. That is the unique name. What else should probably be an attribute for a stock? Company name. May not be unique. McDonald's makes a point of suing companies that try to use the word McDonald's in their name. Okay. Guess what two companies have very similar names that are huge? Cisco. When you think of Cisco, you think of what? CISCO, the router. But what other big company has a similar name? SYCO is a big food services company. Which do you think could have sued the other? SYCO existed first. Okay, they could have a beef about the fact that their name sounds exactly the same as CISCO. But at any rate, those are two different names, but synonyms. Okay, at any rate, this is an important point. When you actually create the relation ship for investor, probably the name of the stock would not appear here. It would probably be appear in the stock relation. Ticker is a good foreign key, but the name of the stock, we don't need to be storing it here. But we will get to that when we get to normalization next week. Okay? So, finishing up. Give me a moment or so to finish up. A stock gets purchased or when a stock gets purchased or sold by an investor, we record the stock's ticker symbol, the transaction price, the date, the number of shares, the investor who purchased it, the advisor who conducted it. Wow, that's a mouthful. Okay, but this sounds a lot like a relationship. Why? There's a lot of entities being mentioned here. When a stock gets purchased or sold by an investor, we record the stock's ticker symbol, so ticker symbol, transaction price, date, number of shares purchased, sold, investor who purchased it, advisor who conducted the transaction. That sounds like a relationship. So there's a stock there's an investor and there's an advisor. That mouthful, when you get a huge mouthful like that, that's a lot uh, with a lot of entities. Sounds like a relationship. So we add to here, this is the crowning finishing touch to our ER diagram. We add a big old diamond and we'll say purchases or sells between an investor, a stock, and an advisor. And it has some attributes that include the number of shares, the price, whether it's sold or purchased, so sell or a buy, Anything else? Uh, ticker symbol, uh, date. OK, 
Okay, so we'll put in date. Now, you don't have to put in all the foreign keys. They're implied. The advisor, the stock, and the investor, those are implied. Same thing here. Actually, I didn't need ticker symbol, name, or dividend. Because ticker is implied by the stock, the name and the dividend are stored with the stock, so the only thing we really need is the number of shares. I'm not going to bust your chops for putting these other things in the ER diagram. I'm just telling you, you don't really need the other three because they're kind of implied. That's my ER diagram. Yes? Isn't the relationship I need to know the number of shares that are owned. That's a quantity. That's over time we buy and sell. Could you not derive that from the first relationship? You could, but you'd need multiple tuples. So, so it's, it's a good question, but a derived attribute doesn't normally, eh, I see what you're saying. Maybe, maybe not. You're right. It could be considered a derived attribute. Good point. But the book doesn't consider it that way. Okay. Um, Luke, let me take your question up here. I'm going to publish this answer. Okay. So the answer is going to be up there. You'll notice, by the way, one last thing. I never filled that out. But you should be able to infer that. What is that? What's the inference about how many stocks can um, a an investor can own zero to many stocks? A stock can be owned by zero, zero, zero probably one to many. We probably don't keep it in our database if it's not owned by anyone, but we might. That's something to clarify.